production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing culture, and connecting the community to artists, events, and classes at columbusmakesart.com. PNC, committed to Central Ohio, for the achiever in you. From these contributing sponsors and viewers like you, thank you. This time on Broad and High. Meet a Columbus designer who fuses African and Asian aesthetics into her fashions. I will call my aesthetic more of like an Afrofusion. A Delaware-based artist who creates masterpieces out of duct tape. And we're launching a new in-studio music series with a performance by Central Ohio band, Mungbean. This and more right now on Broad and High. Hey everyone, I'm Kate Quickle and welcome back to Broad and High. Can you believe this is our 175th episode? We feel so privileged for the opportunity to share with you all the stories of creativity that make our city so great. So let's jump right into our sixth season. First up, we've got a young fashion designer who draws inspiration from the colors and prints of her native Ghana in West Africa, as well as from the patterns and silhouettes of Asia to create a unique look that she describes as Afrofusion. Her name is Esther Sands, her brand is Amamre, and this is her story. We're just gonna make a skirt, why not? I was born in Ghana, West Africa. I came here when I was 16. Went to school in Westerville, went to OSU, graduated from OSU. I started in an engineering, civil engineering, and then I switched to art. My day job is quality assurance for a pharmaceutical company. I will call my aesthetic more of like an Afrofusion. I love different cultures, so I combine my culture with different cultures, mostly adding the prints and the fabrics and the brightness of my culture with like, let's say a kimono. I love Asian culture. It's a little close to my culture in terms of food and traditions. And so I wanted to take the traditional clothes, like a hanfu, like a kimono, and try and make them with all African fabric. The brand name is Amamre. Amamre in my language, which is the Akan Chi language, means culture or traditions. The men's wear specifically, since I'm so new to it, I do draw my inspiration from Asian men's fashion because it's sleek, it's nice, it's sophisticated. The brand tells a story. It's a way for the client, the customer, to tell their own story of being bold and confident. Uh, my husband's name is Joshua Sands. He is awesome. He kind of pushes me to take more risks. And he's a mechanical engineer. He's a design engineer. And he sews as well and cosplays as well. And he's currently gotten into chainmail. For this one, you just basically have to make sure that uh, one ring is going to six rings. We do uh, cosplay. We go to uh, Hyocon and the Ohio Renaissance Festival. So we, we kind of dabble in some fun stuff too. I like the process. However, when it's finished and you actually see the design in your head come to life, it's, it's really fulfilling. That's, that's the part that I love. You can see more of the Amamre fashion line designed by Esther Sands at amamre.com or find her on Instagram. 
Our next story takes us up to Delaware, Ohio, where we find John Catania. He's a graphic designer who also dabbles in paint, mosaics, and even metal. But when he started using duct tape, it just, well, stuck. I was doing the Art at the Arnold, um, which is Arnold Schwarzenegger's annual event here in Columbus, Ohio. And one year my wife kind of pushed me, she said, why don't you try to do your duct tape at, at the uh, Arnold? So I did, I was worried that I wasn't gonna have enough time to get it in, so I had basically two full, full days, two full eight hour days. And in the 16th hour, I uh, completed the, my very first piece, which I did in 2013. It was actually the 25th anniversary for the Arnold Classic. So it got entered and it actually took third place, which I was very proud of. Um, and then from there, every year after, I've been doing it since 2013. And I wanted to create a body of work that was focused on the Olympic sports. So, you know, rowing, archery, gymnastics, and so on. Um, this year I did a boxing piece that was very challenging because I actually have three um, human forms in that piece. Typically it's been only one. My background is graphic art. Um, I worked for an ad agency as an art director, so always had a passion for graphic design. And so I, of course, went with a 2D approach to, uh, to the duct tape art. My wife being a, um, a fiber artist, a weaver, she um, actually made hand-woven um, pieces of duct tape that she wove into these beautiful baskets. I try to keep the designs as original as possible, either from a photograph I've taken or and sometimes I, I find images on, um, on the internet and modify them and try to bring them into more of a graphic state. So I'll bring them in into the computer and work in Illustrator and kind of simplify the shapes, maybe make them more posterized if they're a photograph. And then um, do a printout of that um, design and I work with my design on the back of the plexiglass so that I can see through the plexiglass and actually see my, see my design through it. As I work with the design underneath, I do what's, what an artist might call uh, underpainting. I'm doing undertaping. In other words, I'm laying color where it needs to go um, based on my design that I'm seeing through my plexiglass. And then um, after that phase, I will take the design from the back of my piece and put it on top use it as an overlay and it's in perfect re registration with the original that was on the back and I'll actually with an exacto knife cut through my template my design template and some of the layers of the duct tape the last phase I do is I'll put black tape over everything and as I cut through I'll start to peel away to reveal um, the color tape that's underneath very challenging because um, it sticks to itself so well. Um, it can be frustrating. It's very time consuming. It's a lot of work with an X-Acto knife to really get the detail that I'm after. But the thing that makes me smile is when I peel away to reveal this area that I've been creating and cutting on for an hour and just to see it start to come together, to see the graphic elements start to work and kind of uh, complete my vision of what the piece is going to be um, is, is always rewarding. Check out more of John's work on his website at johnvcatania.com. So we are super excited to launch a new local music series here on Broad and High. We've been inviting Central Ohio musicians to come into our studio to perform some of their original tunes so you can experience the wealth of musical talent we have right here in Columbus. We're starting off the series with the lush synth sounds of Mung Bean and their song titled Waking Up.
You can sample more music by Mungbean on Spotify or by visiting their Bandcamp page. You can also catch them live in concert on Saturday, October 20th at Space Bar in Columbus. Check out the band's Facebook page for details. Our final story tonight takes us to the Dayton Correctional Institution. In a project called Pens to Pictures, incarcerated women learn how to make their own short films from script to screen. Here's more. Pens to Pictures is a filmmaking collaborative where I teach and work with women who are incarcerated in making their own short films from script to screen. I wanted to create a humanizing platform for women who are incarcerated. As a society, we tend to write off those who are incarcerated or we pathologize them upon release. I taught an eight-week short screenwriting intensive, and it's the exact short screenwriting curriculum that I use in my classes at Wright State University. And after the screenwriting intensive, we then go into about a two, three week directing intensive where we actually bring in professional actors to rehearse with the ladies in the prison. That's also where each participant meets their co-director, an emerging filmmaker or professional filmmaker who will execute the vision of the participant on the outside since the participant is incarcerated. My co-director was amazing. She understood me and she was there throughout the process. We learned the entire process from beginning to end. It was amazing. As a woman prisoner, I feel like America's dirty little secret. As a black woman, we have two strikes against us. People become intimidated by us when we are outside of their definition of what we're supposed to be. So it's a struggle even in prison. It's just like being a black woman in America, except for it's a smaller space. We really built a safe space for us to share and explore some really painful moments in our lives. And so they all opened up. It was a moment of freedom that transcended the kind of physical bars that encased their lives at the moment. When I got here, I was basically completely empty. So this was one of those experiences I think that kind of filled me back up. When we finally got to see the footage, it was like like a mind-blowing experience to think that something that we created mentally had come to life. When we were asked to write a short story, I just kind of figured like write what you know. So I wrote about a girl that was a heroin addict trying to get treatment and just the reality of what that looks like. I think that making the film was in a lot of ways like closing the door on my experience as a heroin addict. I was using heroin as a teenager, and so I did that for close to a decade and slowly reaped the consequences of that. I went through a lot, just being an addict, being in bad relationships, and had a daughter, and then became incarcerated. I love her so much. She's so inspiring. She has so much life that it makes me want to be more alive as well. I'm ready to go home and be there. I wanted Pens to Pictures to challenge some of the stigmatizing that goes on when it comes to the way we look at those who are in corrective control. The process of incarceration is so degrading that it kind of like strips you raw. Once you are brought through booking, that process alone, that it's meant to carry you down mentally and emotionally. Pins to Pictures has been one of those profound, pivotal moments that happens in your life. And it challenged me to kind of look inside myself and be more honest with who I am. And I've learned that I can accomplish anything, that I'm worthy, that I'm enough. My favorite part was when we were finished, when we got to present our films. We had a premiere here at DCI and the crowds response to our films, it was like, yes, I did it. Like, I accomplished what I set out to accomplish. And that was probably the best day of my life. I think that art gives you a way to go in and, and translate that inner stuff into the outer world. And I think that's important. People need to heal. You don't come to prison if you're not kind of broken. It's an opportunity and it's a gift. Writing that story that I wrote was very difficult. 
my story was pretty painful, pretty um, intense, but I was also able to see it in a new light. I learned that I can push past boundaries that I had. I learned that I can go further than I ever thought I could, that I can face pain, that I could overcome it. I learned that I was stronger than I ever knew. This experience has been transformative for all involved, but in particular, the writer directors, because it puts them at the forefront of their own narratives. It gives them a level of control and freedom that was stripped from them. It reminds them that they are worthy, worthy of being seen, worthy of being heard, that we have stories that are worthy of being told. That's our show. You can check out all of our stories online at WOSU.org, or you can download our free WOSU public media mobile app. Of course, you can always find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We're leaving you today with more music by Mung Bean. For all of us here at WOSU from the beautiful Cultural Arts Center, I'm Kay Quickle. We'll see you back here next week. We the spirit of the Harlem Renaissance. Go to cbusharlem100.org for more information. So the inspiration for this exhibition comes from a book that was published in 1955. It's called The Sweet Fly Paper of Life. So, you know, in this period of the 1950s, uh, African-American family life was not exactly something that was visible. The photographs are by um, an artist named Roy de Carava, and the text is by uh, Langston Hughes. So this exhibition sort of begins with that book, but it includes a number of contemporary artists who are, you know, thinking um, and sort of visualizing African American family life, but also sort of pushing our notions of what a family is. You know, the show has, you know, a lot of different sort of representations of family, whether it's, you know, immediate family, extended family. And, you know, from, from my work, I really wanted to focus 
on pictures of people who have been very, very important in the sort of development of my artistic practice and myself as a, as a person. And for me, the, the really powerful thing about the piece collectively is that you see you know, all these young, um, intelligent you know, black people who are in their environments um, and very much in, in their space and they sort of command your, your attention in a way. I mean, I think the most powerful thing about art is that you can enter into a museum or a gallery and after seeing a show, you can go back into the world and actually see the world anew. That's my ultimate, ultimate hope is to change the way that, uh, or influence the way that people see the world around them. Catch Columbus at its creative best on Broad and High, Thursday nights at 8 o'clock on WOSU-TV. Production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing culture, and connecting the community to artists, events, and classes at columbusmakesart.com. PNC, committed to Central Ohio, for the achiever in you. From these contributing sponsors, and viewers like you, thank you.